face, everyone. Is there anyone here who doesn't like chocolate? Okay. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Anna Grazier, and um, I live in Exeter. I'm a photographer, obviously. I specialize in weddings and personal events, um, and also food photography. Um, and once a year I produce a, a retreat for about 250 photographers. It's a three-day retreat based on, um, tell me if I need to speak up, please. Um, it's a three-day retreat based on the subject areas of business, craft, and, and vision. Um, and I'm also a chocolate maker. <laughs> so I'm really excited to talk to you guys about chocolate. Um, I get to share with you what I think and hope is special about my work. And hopefully this will give you some perspective on what is special about what you do as well. Um, part of what makes magic magic is that it is not possible to know it. <laughs> so with that caveat, I'm going to share with you what I do know. I spent my childhood in a very, very, very very small town called Halfway, Oregon. Halfway's a no stoplight town. It'll be a cold day in hell when they put a stop sign here. <laughs> it's a, a beautiful, beautiful, deep valley, kind of the valley you would have drawn as a first grader when you had to draw the perfect town in the perfect valley surrounded by the perfect mountains. It's uh, just gorgeous. Um, the people there are mostly ranchers and cowboys plus some kind of fringe artist or just weird types, and that's what my family was. <laughs> my mom ran the local newspaper, and um, while she worked, a woman named Mary Beth watched me. And I'll always think of uh, Mary Beth when I eat milk and graham crackers, because <laughs> that's the snack she gave me. Um, and when I think of milk and graham crackers, I think of bears, because Mary Beth had this huge bear skin draped across the couch in her living room, the head still attached and the big glass beady eyes. I was absolutely terrified of this bear. Uh, Mary Beth's husband, Dick, used to like to show off the buck knife that he used when he wrestled this bear that he met in the woods. Oops, I hit my button. Set that down. So every time I see a bear, I think of this man, Dick Lott, who was an old time gold miner and rancher and killed a bear with his bare hands and lived on this ranch at the end of the world. And I think of graham crackers <laughs> and I think of this. One day I was sitting at Mary Beth's table having my snack and she uh, told me, quick, Go stand over there behind the door frame. Just step out of the kitchen, look in. Don't move, don't make a sound, don't breathe. So I went and hid behind the door. And Mary Beth opened the kitchen drawer next to the sink and took out some toothpicks and tape. And she wrapped a toothpick with tape to her finger and told me to be quiet again. She turned to her kitchen window and opened it and leaned out and when she came in, there was a hummingbird perched on her finger. She was perfectly silent, her eyes were closed, and they were conversing. And then she turned around and uh, the hummingbird was gone. My home life at this time was not uh, stable. I had a small backpack by my door, which had um, probably a sweater and a flashlight, a note. Um, my stepfather was explosive. So my mom sometimes feared for our lives. And I had instructions to take this backpack and walk to the nearest neighbor, maybe a mile away. Um, I don't really remember this backpack. <laughs> But of course, I remember the fear. Um, and I don't often share that, but I wanted to share with you today because it's relevant to our topic today um, in this way. 
Um, I often ask myself what enabled me to move beyond that fear. Um, I carry my own share of burdens or baggage as an adult, like we all do. Um, but this question of what, like what, what has kept me from <laughs> crashing and hitting rock bottom, um, like some people do when they grow up in those circumstances. Um, and when I think of this question, this, always, this hummingbird pops into my brain, <laughs> always. Um, so I think the answer of this, the answer to the question is this. I was always aware of the unknown, a possibility of what was beyond. And this memory of the hummingbird pops into my thoughts to remind me that there is a vast unknown. And in this unknown is magic and potential. Um, I've always been a daydreamer. <laughs> I've always gazed into this abyss of the unknown. And I find peace and solace in that and in knowing that there's more possible and impossible than what I can ever imagine. And that was my, and continues to be my lifeline. <laughs> Yay, magic, chocolate. All right. So magic has to do with the boundary of our senses, our awareness of what's possible and impossible, what's real. And I believe we all experience magic when this boundary shifts and when we're aware of this expansion. <coughs> True magic doesn't require you to believe in magic because it's an experience. It's about recognizing and submitting to experiencing the unknown. And simultaneously, it's the expansion of our awareness of what is known and understood. Uh, magic tricks, thank you, Michael. <laughs> Entertaining and wonderful as they are, uh, require you to put some of your senses on hold. And that's not the kind of magic that I came to talk to you about. Um, what I'm referring to doesn't require you to disbelieve any truth. It, it asks you to activate all of your senses. So, I need some water. We'll get to chocolate, I promise. <laughs> um, in a while, we, we will share chocolate. And I will ask you to turn on, activate all of your senses. And I don't mean just the traditional five senses. I also mean your logic, your intuition, your conscious and subconscious memory. All of this contributes to your whole sensory experience. And this is why chocolate was used in worship and ceremony by the Mayans. It's such a strong substance that it activates and broadens our sensory experience. Um, how can it not? <laughs> it has over 600 identified flavonoids. Wine only has 300. Just saying. <laughs> um, it triggers memories and daydreams. It allows us to connect with our animal senses. This taste experience that can be felt in the bones, beyond the taste buds, at the cellular level is what I want to draw your attention to. And this, this physical sensory experience draws us into a state of, of greater awareness and uh, presence. So some of you are probably wondering why Anna Grazier, the photographer, is here talking to us about chocolate. Um, I've spent my life studying the human experience um, as a photographer, an archaeologist, and a chocolate maker. It's true of all of my work. Um, as a photographer, I'm not just trying to make an elegant composition. Um, I'm trying to illustrate or translate an emotion or feeling. Um, a lot of people know me or think of me as a highly visual person, but in reality, I'm, um, I am that, but I am also very uh, kinesthetically oriented. I experience everything physically. Even when I'm taking pictures, when I look through the viewfinder, I'm, I'm waiting for, to feel something in me when I, when I connect with 
that person's heart through the lens, that's, that's what I'm looking for is that physical feeling that I have. Um, who here does creative work? Just a few of us. <laughs> so here's my philosophy about what we do. Our work as creators is not to make magic. It is to make and make and make and make and make. Right, James? He's nodding, thank you. And finally, hopefully, recognize when we've made something special. Something magic. This is, of course, where our real work begins. Once you've recognized what it is that's special about what you're doing, you have to pursue it. You have to follow it. Make it. Be with it. Share it. So the one golden rule that I've found is important to um, living a creative life is when you sense something special, give chase. See it through. And this is what brought me to chocolate. Um, there is another aspect to, ch to uh, magic that I'd like to draw your attention to, and I think it's a particularly important and relevant in a creative community, and that's the shared experience. Um, there's really nothing like being part of a whole room full of people listening to a musician or a story or witnessing a, a piece of art. Um, humans crave commonality and connection, synchronicity. Uh, when we experience life through what others see and do, our own experience is validated and it's enriched. We're fascinated when we have a similar experience and we're fascinated when we have a contrasting experience. We want to see what others see and do and hear and feel, how they react. This is why we have music and art and newspapers. It's why we have reality TV. It's why we have creative mornings. It's why we're compelled to share. We want to see how others react and perceive the world and our own worldview broadens in, in beautiful ways when we share experiences. So back to this concept of the shifting of boundaries. If you leave with nothing else today, I want to ask you to recognize and give honor to the value of an experience that is entirely new. We're often afraid of new before it happens. Once it happens, we're changed. In fact, that's probably why we're afraid of it. Our animal selves are saying, well, something's going to change. Um, but when you hear a, a weird musician or visit a new place, you're giving yourself a new experience. And this is true of our more difficult experiences too. The end of a relationship, changing or loss of a job or a house, the death of somebody we love. We grow and expand beyond the definition of what we were before. We're different. The world is different in sometimes wonderful and sometimes awful ways. We can't always control the bad stuff, but we can always continue to give ourselves new and wondrous experiences. Um, I have two things to pass around here because we're going to start our sensory experience with smell. This one, we'll just start this one here. This is cocoa beans. They're raw. Actually, they're not raw. They're fermented. So smell. They're not roasted. That's what we mean by raw. This is finished chocolate. And just take a minute to stick your nose in there and breathe it because you're going to smell more than chocolate in a good way. So, let's talk about chocolate. I've always been fascinated by chocolate, by its flavor, its history, its cultural significance. And a few years ago, just for fun, I decided to take a truffle making class. Um, I practiced making ganache. I infused cream with herbs. I researched the historical 
significance around certain spice blends. Um, I daydreamed about flavor pairings and I, I uh, started researching. I, was, I, I wanted to find the very best chocolate couverture that I could use for my pretend truffle company. Um, I asked, what is the best brand? What, what country should I get it from? Should it be from Ecuador or Peru? Um, what, what percentage is ideal? Should it be, uh, does it have to be certified organic or in fair trade or non-GMO? Um, it turns out that none of these were the, the that these were, these were all the wrong questions, but they, they led me to the right questions. And I discovered that there is a small number, a very small number of people in the world who are making bean to bar chocolate. Um, and they don't care, care, care so much about the, the flavor inclusions and other, other ingredients. They, they're concerned just with one ingredient, cacao, which you're smelling hopefully, uh, plus sugar, um, and nothing else. And they're exploring the flavor that's unique to each variety and, and region. Um, these don't really coincide with my talk, so we're just flipping through. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, does anybody here prefer milk chocolate? Anyone like dark chocolate? <laughs> So a lot of you, especially those who raise your hand to dark chocolate, think you, you're, you're a 65% or you like 78 or 82 and a half or maybe 99%. Um, I think you're limiting yourself in unnecessary ways. Um, when cacao is freed from the extra confectionery ingredients and, and the, the mass uh, processing, that's, that's used in large-scale chocolate production, um, the, f the flavor notes are freed as well. And the, the flavor crosses a huge spectrum. It's not, there's not one single point in roast or percentage that's correct. Um, the, the percentage of sugar is gonna mask or reveal certain flavor notes across the spectrum. And the same with the roast. Um, and it's all very fascinating. Um, so when we taste my chocolate in a minute, I have chocolate for you to taste too. Um, some of you might even think you're tasting milk, but there's no milk in it. Um, I became completely, ask my husband, completely obsessed with understanding this new world that I was completely unaware of before. Um, I tasted chocolate. <coughs> I, I made chocolate, I made friends taste chocolate, I made friends with chocolate makers. I read chocolate, I YouTubed chocolate. <laughs> I purchased my first piece of equipment, a, a little Indian uh, stone grinder, which is used to make chocolate in a really small batch. I, I bought it in secret and hid it in the pantry till I was ready to tell Matt that I had bought this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my, I, I ordered my first bag of raw, uh, unroasted cacao, and I opened it and my eyes just filled with tears when I, when I opened that bag and inhaled it for the first time. Um, I roasted these first beans. Um, I cracked them with a rolling pin. I blew the husks off with a hair dryer. <laughs> put through them in my grinder and, and then I, when I thought it was smooth I dumped it out and I, I had seen uh, videos of people tempering chocolate on a marble slab so I dumped it onto a slab and roll, like pushed it around and then I, and I poured it back into a mold. I figured well okay that, that's, that's tempered which it, it wasn't. It, like the cocoa butter bloomed out and made weird patterns in it. Um, but I had made chocolate. And I made everyone taste this chocolate. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I, ra I wrapped it in little gold foil, and I, I, t I walked around the block. I knocked on every door, and I made every neighbor taste it. All the people I didn't know, I was like, oh, I'm making chocolate. And they were like, what? This is kind of gross, but OK. <laughs> I took it to every chef I know. Uh, I made them taste it. And um, the point wasn't that, that it was delicious, it was that I had made chocolate. And, it, and at that point I knew how utterly challenging this process was. So I, when they tasted it, I told them, you have to taste it now because you, 
you need to know how far I've traveled when I come back to you with good chocolate. <laughs> um, so yeah, I became obsessed with this seed. I think, I think chocolate making, um, I'm not a good bread maker. I've never tried to make beer or wine, but I think it's similar to those processes. Um, there are only a few steps two or three ingredients maybe at most are really necessary, maybe one ingredient. Um, but the steps just require infinite finesse and nuance and um, they're a perfect blend of art and science and uh, alchemy. Um, it's pretty easy when it's all said and done to make chocolate, but it's, it's really hard to make good chocolate. Um, so flavor was that, that first hook for me, but I'm not only interested in, in chocolate because of that. I, I'm working directly with farmers um, and people and a material that's touched by everything that's happening in the world. Um, it's, when I read the newspaper, there are connections in the world economics and biodiversity, politics, war, culture, all of that is, is touched directly. Um, by these these beans that you're smelling and the, the chocolate that we'll eat later today it's and it's all um, fascinating to me let's see what slides next <laughs> ah. um, so craft chocolate makers are working directly with small farmers and farming co-ops all over the world and because we work in in extremely tiny volumes we're able to explore a range of flavors that just don't exist in the monoculture of plantation-grown chocolate. Um, so we're preserving genetic diversity and culture. We're establishing stronger uh, economies for local farmers. Um, and we're, we're really having a, a very direct impact on the economic and living conditions in, in these developing nations. Um, So yeah, I wasn't gonna talk about my slides, but I do wanna point out that there are kind of two locations where flavor happens. One is where the chocolate is grown and, and it, multiple things can go wrong or right and it's, it's, a, it's a, essentially a wild plant. It's like the apples where every plant from a new seed could taste completely different. Um, so there are, there are some clone varieties that are grown in plantations in the major cocoa producing countries of Mali and Indonesia and Nigeria. Um, and then there are other clone varieties at a much smaller scales all around the world. Um, so genetics affects it, but also the, the way the beans are handled and the fermentation is, is really critical. And that's a part that is out of my hands. I have to rely on the people who are sourcing chocolate for me to oversee that part of the process and make sure it's a good ferment. Um, th this is what I'm doing. Ah. And we'll get to that when we do questions and answers. I'll answer questions about the process if you guys have them. Um, but I do want to share with you where chocolate grows uh, because this is fascinating too. It's originally from S Central America um, and it was brought to South America in ancient times and, and, and then with the Spanish explorers and conquistadors and then colonists, it was transported around the world and it grows within 20 degrees of the equator, literally around the world. Um, I've worked with chocolate from Vietnam and Tanzania and uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico. There's chocolate growing in Hawaii, Vanuatu, um, Papua New Guinea, and, and uh, many places in Africa. Um, we're gonna get to chocolate tasting. So we, can I have some help handing these out? So don't open these. <laughs> Wait for me to tell you. I will share a little bit about how chocolate was, is made um, at the craft, at the micro level. Um, the technology for making chocolate was literally only available at a large factory scale until about 15 years ago. 
unless you were going to do small stone ground chocolate like they still do in Guatemala and a lot of other countries at the very you know local direct scale. Um, but the technology for making a smooth refined chocolate um, was all owned by uh, Mars and Hershey's and all of these large chocolate makers. Um, but like you and I, a lot of people have always been obsessed with chocolate. So somebody much more obsessive than me discovered about 15 years ago that this Indian stone grinder, which is used for making dal and nut paste, also can refine chocolate down to this, a smooth enough flavor to match what we, what, we, what we crave from these big chocolate producers that have been, don't open it yet, that have been making it. <laughs> that have been making chocolate. Um, so when, when this uh, discovery was made, it happened to be made by somebody who um, believes in sharing knowledge. So he shared it and started a website with a forum where a, a couple people and then more and then more people started joining in and sharing knowledge and experiences with how to make chocolate. And it's all MacGyvered together. There is no machinery for what I'm doing at my scale. I'm using a wet grinder. I'm using plumbing parts to winnow and a Hoover vacuum. I'm using a Krankenstein barley cracker and a champion juicer to crack my beans. Um, and I'm using a coffee bean roaster and my home oven to roast. Uh, there's nothing that's made for me at, at my scale except the molds, which are obviously made at any scale. Uh, so does everyone have chocolate? Okay, good. Okay, so we're gonna start with the bean. So open your little baggie and take out the bean. Crinkle, 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 crinkle. And this is a cocoa bean. The cocoa bean comes in a pod. They grow in a pod surrounded by this white pulpy fruit, which is also quite delicious. Um, and there are, you know, from, from 30 to 70 beans in a typical pod. The pod is cut open right when it's harvested and those beans with their pulpy mass are put right into a box for fermenting. Um, and then they're dried, eventually brought to me, I roast it. This is the roasted bean that we're gonna eat. Don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't want you to eat the husk. The husk is kind of gross. So um, crack it between your fingers if you can. I, tr I tried to test most of them and make sure they're crackable. Um, crack it, pull that papery husk off. Try not to make a mess. I'm sorry, music hall. Um, <laughs> Some of you will love this if you like dark chocolate. This is the nib. This is 100% chocolate. This is all, this is the only ingredient you need to make chocolate. Uh oh. You can eat it, or if it's, it might be strong, so you might want to break it and eat a little piece. Um, I like to eat it. Um, so this, just this is the cocoa nib. It's roasted. So it's different from the nibs that you might see at like health food juice bars. They're often using unroasted nibs, which are more fruity, whiny, fermenty flavored. Um, I prefer the roasted flavor. I also feel that it's um, safer to eat a roasted bean because we are working with a product from a developing country. It's been harvested and fermented and dried out in the sun among chickens. Um, I've found feathers and rocks in my beans. I have colleagues who found bullet casings. Um, there are all sorts of things can go wrong with um, how the cocoa is hand handled. It can carry salmonella. Um, so for that reason, I don't generally eat raw chocolate. You can if you want. Um, so that's the bean. And, that, and, and like I said, that's all you need to make chocolate. And we're going to add sugar and go on to the next one. Don't eat it yet. I'll tell you a little about it. Um, first, you can take, break off a little piece and take it out. Let's walk you through a, a t chocolate tasting. What I like to do is look at the chocolate, uh, look at how dark it is, what color it is. Some chocolate's more black, some's more red. Uh, and that is so regardless of the percentage. Um, note, if, note how shiny it is. Um, some makers choose a mold based on the, how the texture will feel in your mouth and how, how it will melt. Um, and you can note if there's bubbles or if it's cracked or you know, has other markings and some of those bubbles are, are not a bad thing. They're you know, due to the fact that I'm making chocolate in my home kitchen and I'm not using a professional vibrating machine to get all the bubbles out. But uh, too much texture and, and that might reduce the experience of enjoying it. So smell it. Oh good, most of you are with me. If some of you have eaten, I'll forgive you, but, <laughs> but follow along. <laughs> 
smell it and then give it a little snap and again we want a good snap because that means the chocolate is tempered properly and and when it's tempered chocolate is actually a, a crystalline structure the cocoa butter forms a crystalline structure and when it's uh, tempered well the little crystals are kind of a hexagonal thing that fit nice and neat together and make a nice uniform smooth shape and it breaks nicely some chocolate is more viscous thicker softer <coughs> So sometimes a, a weaker snap doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad temper, but um, it just reflects the, 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 the characteristic of this chocolate. Okay, so now put a piece in your mouth. <laughs> Don't swallow. Just give a little chew or two chews and just let it melt slowly on your tongue. Um, does anybody in here study wine, taste wine, <coughs> beer? So just like wine you can give your give your do a little breathe sip and you can actually sip open your mouth and breathe in air and then close your mouth and that oxygenation will affect your tasting experience and just notice how those flavors hit you in the beginning in the middle this is a very low acid chocolate it, to me it's not very fruity uh, but I, I get and you can tell you guys might get something totally different and this is part of what's fun about chocolate but I get um, there's, there's a sugar cookie that you bake it until it gets like the sugar caramelizes. I don't know what it's called, but it's like a, like a Dutch biscuit or something. I get that, what? A caramelized sugar cookie. Exactly, yes. <laughs> a caramelized, caramelized sugar cookie. There we go. Um, I've never eaten a tobacco leaf, but I, I get a little bit of floral, um, tarry floral, quality that I, I imagine is what people are referring to when they say it has tobacco notes. Um, it's a little bit nutty for me. It's delicious. Thank you. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's delicious. And then, uh, yeah, you can finish it slowly or quickly, however you want, save it for later. Um, but if, at the end, for me, this one uh, rises up slowly with this tannin quality. I get a little bit of that wine tanniny quality at the very end and that um, flavor follows me with this chocolate. You'll still probably taste it a little bit later. Um, so, um, and then note as you're, as you're tasting it, um, the, the emotional sensations. Do you get a visual picture? Um, you're reminded of something or someone or maybe you just feel like you want to buy some chocolate <laughs> that's fine um, but when I'm when I'm testing my chocolate <coughs> oh yeah <laughs> that's what I wanted to get to so I, was like, I can't, can't do this talk and not show this picture um, at one point in my roasting notes, when I was when I was working with my Tanzanian chocolate, I, I was writing you know cinnamon, lemon, raspberry, and then halfway down my notes it said, uh, "Girl walking down a dusty road with the, like sun bleached straw," and I was like, "Hmm, that's interesting. So let's follow that." So I roasted that. I didn't like that batch, but sometimes I get these visuals that are fascinating. And another note that I wrote in my tasting book was. Um, sparkle it's sort of an effervescence and that that was a quality that I did maintain and carry through to the finished bar and I I spoke with another maker who worked with that chocolate uh, and they actually not me they actually said it has a slight effervescence when they were working with it so they found that note at some point in their roasting logs and they followed that thread too I thought that was fascinating so I want to move on to questions but um, first I do, this is what I want to leave you with. Um, when in doubt, welcome it, because hidden in the unknown is opportunity. Um, learn to recognize when magic happens and then pursue it. Share. Acknowledge and honor your own sensory experience and embrace new. And if you do all of these things, you will bring magic into your lives. Um, and here's what I want to end with. Uh, probably the best compliment paid to me about my chocolate so far was my son's friend was visiting the house and, oh, your mom's a chocolate maker? Whoa. So he tasted it and he, his eyes just popped out and he said, 
this tastes real. <laughs> so. so there you have it. Um, I do. Uh, there's this cool picture there. This is um, chocolate as it's aging. After I've made it in my grinder, I pour it out and I age it. And uh, the acids continue to develop and settle down. The, the flavor really changes pretty significantly over the first couple weeks. And as it's doing this, the, the cocoa butter is crystallizing. And it forms these crazy patterns. Sometimes they look like worm tracks. And these are like inch big uh, circular structures if you break it if you break up the cocoa you'll have like a little marble of chocolate that has formed in this fractal pattern it's fascinating it's a three-dimensional uh, thing so questions <laughs>